Okay. Okay, welcome to our second Fall Prevention Month talk at Toronto Rehab Institute here. Thanks for joining us. We've actually got a little bit of a crowd building here. This is, this is great. Have a seat and jo uh, join us. I know there's a lot of people behind maybe getting sandwiches at the Druxies. Feel free to come on over and join us as you're ready. Today we have a really exciting talk. We have Dr. Yue Li who's joining us. Uh, yesterday in our kind of inaugural talk, we showed a little video of a fall that happened at the intersection here at Elm and University. It was in the winter. There was snow. Uh, there was someone who was rushing across the street and we saw this gentleman fall. Thankfully, I don't think he was hurt because he was actually, uh, you saw him get up right away and walk on. But if you think about what are the different reasons that fall could have happened, we think there could be sort of three main main groups. One is that it could be the environment, something about the snow and the snow clearing and the, and the design of the intersection that could be a problem. There could be something about the person themselves that could be causing the risk of falls. So if they have a head injury or a stroke or something or a balance problem, could be the reason. Um, and then there's the interface between the person and the environment, in this case, the footwear. So that's what we're going to talk partly about today and also how we stay active in the winter. You know, we talk a lot about falls prevention, um, but it's, you know, one of the things we like to stress here at Toronto Rehab Institute is it's just as important to make sure we stay active as it is to make sure we don't fall. We all know that it's super important to stay, to keep exercising and to stay healthy regardless of what time of year it is. Unfortunately, people stop going outside once it's winter and we stop and we become sedentary during the winter months and that's unfortunate fortunate because we start to lose our physical fitness very quickly if we if we do those things. So you is going to talk about some of the issues, some of the things we can do to stay active, how footwear can protect us from falling. Yue, join us. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Yue Li. And today I'm going to talk about a very big topic, how to address winter fall risk. Uh, actually, I think uh, with the 15 minutes I have, I probably can only touch the surface of this topic. But hopefully, by starting this discussion, we can all contribute to uh, find solutions and pay attention to all the factors that will uh, increase the fall uh, in winter, especially, and uh, to find a solution to reduce those falls. So yesterday, TLAC talked about the falls in all kinds of environments. And today, my focus is winter. So the reason is we have a huge number of people who visit ER every winter in Ontario alone. On the record, there are about 20,000 emergency department visit and 2,000 hospitalization for the injuries from falls on ice and snow. And remember, those are only ER visits. We're not including the family doctor visits. We're not including people who didn't visit any doctors. So. Other results shows that uh, overall across Canada, there might be 300,000 people every winter that might affect by falls involving ice and snow. And this is not only Canadian problem, it's also overall for countries who has snow and the ice. For example, in Sweden, we see that 51% of the injury among pedestrians actually happened during the three months in winter. November to January. So it is a huge issue. And just to make the case worse, when we're talking about winter, those are the images will probably pop into your head. And it's very, um, I think, a very uh, discouraging uh, image for us to look at. For those snow, ice, and the snow banks, and slush, and puddles, how we can address this problem? You, you will pr probably think, you know, winter comes and uh, what can we do to address those fall risks and how can we reduce? So we are researchers, so we always analyze things. And uh, in this way, we break down those risk factors that Tilak mentioned that uh, we have environmental, we have human and we have a system. And uh, today I only going to touch the surface. So for each uh, category, I'm going to talk uh, one factor. So environment, I'm going to talk about pedestrian facilities. And for human factors, I'm to touch uh, some people, they get dizziness. And the, one of the reasons of this dizziness is high blood pressure. And then systematic factors, uh, which is 
the interface between the environment and the human and which when we walk the footwear basically play a huge role uh, in um, prevent slip and fall so to start with we're talking about pedestrian facilities and in the winter we all know that a lot of people scared and worried when they're walking around so we did a survey talking about uh, in the winter where you most concerned about slip and fall and as you can see um, sidewalk uh, naturally is the first one because we spend a lot of time on sidewalk but i would like you to pay attention to the second one is the crossing the street crossing the curb cuts curb runs and also we see the ramps and the driveways entrance uh, those are old um, places that uh, um, the pedestrian facility need to be uh, uh, cleaned up more snow and uh, pay attention the design of those things how can they uh, discourage the build up of snow ice and uh, um, um, the slush so to address these factors and um, in terms of our research and the policymaker and the city we want to and conclude that better pedestrian facilities and the building the designs that consider winter elements are essential for a livable winter city. But for everybody who is going out every day, I think the pay, pay attention to the environment is a very key um, uh, uh, factor that can uh, reduce the fall risk. And for the human factors, of course, we we know that balance issues and other things and um, that apply to uh, all seasons and all environments but the high blood pressure is really closely correlated to the cold temperature so there's a study so here is more dramatic we're not talking about just the injury we're talking about the death rate uh, due to the cardiovascular disease and you can see there's a very nice correlation so here you can see the monthly temperature and here you can see the mortality rate so when the temperature is low oops when the temperature is low we can see a spike and the increase of the uh, winter mortality due to the cardiovascular disease and so these are two countries ireland and norway and the same thing in canada this is a data from quebec so what costs the spike of those death rate and one of the reason we did a study to look at in the winter when you are going out if you are wearing a hat and you are not wearing a hat and how much the blood pressure going up and if you look at the young which is a blue bar we find a significant difference between wearing a hat and not wearing a hat. That means if you wear a hat, not only it keeps you warmer and also going to uh, reduce the rise in blood pressure. The second information is for older people, we also look at the people who is older than 60. We didn't find the dramatic uh, significant uh, difference, but you can still see the trend that there is a um, decrease. And the reason is you can also say the variability among the older people is much bigger. So we find some older people, uh, their blood pressure actually decrease much more or the increase of the blood pressure is very sensitive to hat, but some of it's not. So our next step is to look at who is more sensitive to the wearing a hat and who is not. And for people who is not protected by wearing a hat, what's the other measurements we can um, find to uh, reduce the surge in blood pressure in winter. So for this, basically in the winter, I think it's always true to remember what your grandma told you, wearing a hat in winter, not only keep you warm and also going to protect you to go up, go up the, the high uh, blood pressure. And uh, it's more uh, effective for young from our study, but for older people, I think it's also we see the benefits. And the last one is the today's focus. Uh, we're going to talk about something is 
apply to everybody and we can do things to uh, find a pair of footwear actually is really good for the in winter environment. And in return, we're going to reduce the slip and fall in winter. But currently, when you go to the uh, shoe store and the winter is coming, everybody is, I need a good pair of winter boots. When you go to the shoe store, you look at there's like hundreds of winter boots and you want to find information. Are they good? You can ask the store uh, sellers people. They probably won't tell you. They will say, oh, this is a brand name. It looks good. And you look at the bottom of the shoe, you say, oh, this one looks good, might be good. But nobody really tell you how good it is. So that's the problem because currently all the manufacturers, they don't have a good way to test the slip resistance of the footwear, especially for winter condition. Currently, there are some methods, it's mechanical methods to test the slip resistance, but it's not even on winter surface, it's more for uh, industrial environment, for quarry tile and other. But we can apply these methods and use it on winter surface. So this is a videotape that uh, going to show you one of those mechanic tests that we call Satra machine. And so this is the all in room temperature. So we can make an ice tray. It's also in room temperature. And we basically can drag the footwear across the ice surface. And uh, some of the manufacturers, they use this number to indicate on the footwear to say how good it is. But are they reliable? Are they meaningful? So I'm going to show you some of the results. So this is exactly the same one shoe and on the ice surface. So we have one day one we tested. We keep running it, just the, the same footwear, same ice. And you can see we call this coefficient of friction. So basically it's the indication of how good the slip resistance is. The higher the coefficient of friction, the better the slip resistance. So at the beginning, you will say, oh, this shoes is really good. But then after a couple of runs, we find it's dropped. And then the second day, we repeat the study. We find the same shoe. First out, of course, is higher, then it's stable, and then it starts to increase. So by looking at these three results for the same shoes, how can you decide whether it's good or not? It's not reliable, and it's not meaningful at all. So what should we do if uh, current testing methods fails to produce valid and meaningful results for the testing of uh, uh, slip resistance? And we find the answer. So I'm going to show you a video. That's how we do it. And if you are interested, uh, I encourage you to go downstairs. We have winter lab. Here we have a um, simulated ice surface. So there are real ice. So basically, it's a small ice rink. The pink is um, because the lyco uh, liquid in the pipe to create this ice surface. And the whole room will be able to put on motion base to tilt it. So um, this is the first we ask people to walk on the level ice surface. And then we tilt the room. So they start to walk on the um, slope. And by gradually increase the slope angle, we will find at which angle precisely that uh, the tester going to slip. So as you can see that at the nine degree, this we call dry ice. Um, basically, is there's no water on ice. We also test other conditions. We make the uh, a, a layer of water on, on ice to simulate a very slippery surface. And so at nine degrees, we see that uh, this tester be able to walk up the ice slope. But uh, uh, if you keep playing, you can see that he actually slide down um, the, the ice. So in this way, we'll be able to determine that for this pair of footwear, uh, the nine degree is what we call maximum achievable angle. So imagine I have a hundred types of footwear and I all test through these methods and then I can rank all those footwear and to tell you which one is better and which one is not really good for winter. So if you are interested, we have some footwear over there after the presentation, you can go there and look at those 
footwear and we can tell you which one is better, which one is uh, not as good. So you will see that, uh, oh, well, you are using people to test the footwear. People are different weight, different height. They walk differently. So if you test the footwear, how can we trust that they might have different maximum of triple angle? The results actually is very uh, convincing. Our testing methods is very repeatable because if you look at that, we have 16 people test the same type of footwear. And as you can see, we are only from seven degree to 10 degrees. It's a very repeatable method. And again, if you remember the mechanical one, so it is a mechanical one, you will think it's probably more repeatable, but the truth is it's actually less repeatable than our method. And we also have validation of uh, compare the maximum angle with level walking, and we find it's also applied to level walking. So overall, in summary, our maximum triple angle is a really good, meaningful, valid um, method to um, test the slip resistance of winter footwear. And we are also uh, looking at the different ways to, uh, to increase the angle and be able to apply to other facilities because we want this method become a Canadian standard, become an international standard. So in the near future, hopefully, all the footwear manufacturer they will adopt these methods. And hopefully next winter, in two winters, when you go buy winter footwear, you will see a number on the footwear. So you will see a 10 degree or, or five star footwear, which is valid by this method, is better than a five degree or three star footwear. And so in summary, what we want to do to address the system factor that can and really affect the slip and fall is we want everybody to wear a pair of slip resistant footwear. How we do that? We're going to work with the standard body to make it standard, and we're going to increase the number of footwear that we are going to test, and we publish it in an easily accessible format. And then by publishing those results, everybody can go, for example, a website to check the brand of the footwear, the type, style of the footwear, and you will find compared to other footwear, how good or how bad it is. And in, in return, you will be able to choose the footwear wisely. So to reduce winter fall risks, I only touched the surface, but the take home message today is pay attention to your environment and the dress warm, wear a hat, and the last, if you want to find out how good or how bad you suspect is bad, uh, your winter footwear is, um, please come to here on November 24th or 25th. From one to four, we have open house. You'll be able to test your own footwear in our winter lab on icy surface. So thank you. And if you have further question, uh, you are, uh, free to ask me or ask Ben. Ben is also another researcher uh, working on this project. And we also have website and we have footwear display. So feel free to um, talk with us and we'll be delighted to talk with you and discuss further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yue, for that great presentation. You know, the, what I always think about when I think about Yue's work is, you know, in other areas in, in the consumer market, like if you think about tires, right, winter tires have a little symbol on them that says these are designed to be used in winter. Why don't we have that on shoes? It's rubber, it's on snow and ice, it's the same idea, and that's what Yue is trying to get us towards. So uh, are there any questions before we sign off for the day? Do we have a, a group that's, that's around here? Does anyone have any questions or comments for Yue? No, we can, we can, maybe we'll sign off here then for the, the video and then we'll let people uh, come in person and check out some of the footwear. Oh, yes, Simon. Yeah, just to comment on a, a bystander that walked by here and was carrying straps and she almost fell just like right here while we were having this false prevention month uh, activity. Uh, she didn't, she recovered, but it's still like falls can happen anywhere, right? 
Yeah, that's very true. So uh, we can work on to improve the environment. We can work on our own balance. But uh, if you don't have a good piece of footwear, um, when you're distracted, when um, there is very low friction of the floor, and um, the fall and the slip is really uh, a high risk thing. So uh, start choosing a slip resistant footwear and also, we recommend that for uh, different surface, for example, uh, some footwear, they work really well for winter environment, ice and all those snow surface, not necessary for water contaminant, for example, like the ceramic tile, the water on marbles. So um, our goal is actually to test the footwear on all kinds of surface. So we'll be able to tell you that whether it's only good for certain type of surface or it's good for and generally all surfaces. And uh, we're also working on materials uh, with manufacturers so we can develop new materials that actually work for all those slippery surfaces. On that note, we'll sign off. Thanks for joining us, everyone. And we'll see you again at the next talks.